morning, everyone, and welcome to class 29. Today, we're going to be uh, continuing our discussion of citizenship and personal uh, responsibility, uh, but coming from a different perspective with Sherilyn McGregor's critique of green citizenship and her argument for a, a radical feminist theory of, of green citizenship. Um, so we're going to look a little, think a little bit about how people have traditionally articulated the idea of ecological citizenship or green citizenship, then look at McGregor's critique and reformulation um, through the course of today as kind of a response to some of the discussion that we were having with Jameson's virtue ethics on Monday. So what is green citizenship? Now, if uh, you've probably heard uh, of this idea before, uh, I'm posting on Moodle a, a, a TED talk that talks about uh, green citizenship that you can, uh, that I'm not just going to play here, that you can look at. But well, a good summary comes from the uh, Conservation Council of Ontario, Canada, um, that suggests 10 rules for green citizenship. They include helping nature, saving water, saving energy, using green power, driving less, living locally, eating smart, buying green, wasting less, preventing pollution. Uh, the New York Times also, and we can follow the link here. Um, let me go ahead and switch my screen share so it's the right I'm sharing the right screen, um, uh, gives the, a list of different ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint. Um, and so in this New York Times article, um, it talks about how you can drive less, whether that's using, um, using you riding a bike, taking to public transportation, or also different ways that you can try to make your car more sustainable, uh, purchasing electric cars or hybrids, uh, alternatives for flying, different um, options for eating less meat, uh, a vegan diet or a, or a vegetarian diet, etc. Uh, reducing food waste, uh, trying to make your home more energy efficient, and all of these being different uh, actions that individuals can take on their own as to part of being good environmental citizens. Um, and all of these, you'll probably notice, this idea of green citizenship, as McGregor summarizes, it's a form of citizenship that is, is not political in the same sense. This is not about being member, uh, it's, as, as McGregor writes, it's non-territorial, non-reciprocal, and not confined to the public-private domain. This is not about our particular membership in a, in a political community. It's not Thomas Nagel's arguments about justice and the social contract being kind of co-members of it, co-authors and co-subjects of the same sovereign. McGregor summarizes, it is more about individual values and duties than about rights. And it challenges the traditional emphasis on the individual by locating citizens in a larger community that is global, unequal, and dependent on the natural world. So there is a um, kind of a cosmopolitan element here, right, that our, that our citizenship, our green citizenship, extends beyond our national or state-based citizenship. Um, but it's also, while it's cosmopolitan, it's also very private. It's about how can you, as an individual in your own household with your own families, reduce your personal carbon footprint? Uh, what are the how can you promote a sustainable lifestyle? How can you make responsible choices? So it is very, it's, it's both kind of broader than our traditional kind of state-based citizenship, but it is also uh, more private. It's more, it's, it's, it's more individualistic. And it, it is this broader, it is this hybrid between being broad and individualistic uh, that McGregor is, is intensely uh, critical of. Um, she are, offers a series of critiques of green, of this model of green citizenship. And, and the first is that it, while it is broad, broad and still an exclusionary and a narrow conception of citizenship. She writes on page 612 of the reading um, that these, this model of green citizenship are based on morally, or they, sorry, suffer from being products of intellectual discussions in the affluent global north and being produced by people with privileged lives. That this model of citizenship is what's being, is being applied by um, uh, middle class and upper middle class people who care about the envir environment, um, but there are certain blind spots that this creates. That there are hierarchies and inequalities based on gender, class, race, sexuality, ability, and geography um, that are excluded from this model of green citizenship because it's a it's a 
kind of a universal indiv and individualistic claim that you as an individual have an obligation to do this uh, or do that, to drive less, to become vegan, uh, to install solar panels on your home, um, that risks obscuring the differential access to sustainable technology and the differential um, uh, uh, burden of such actions based on these intersecting social systems. And this, we've talked about this several times when we talked about intersectionality and climate justice. Um, and and it, this fairly abstract conception of a person, it's not a particular person, it's you as this abstract generic individual should take this. So in that model, it's, it's fairly exclusional. Um, additionally, she writes that this model of citizenship is based on morally loaded notions of stewardship or an ecological footprint um, that tends to pre uh, privilege a particularly Western and pristine conception of the natural world that excludes a range of the other types of environment. And this is a critique of environmentalism that has been made by uh, by activists in the global south, as well as uh, environmental justice activists in the in the in the global north. Um, that this model of green citizenship as like doing less, um, polluting less, having a smaller ecological footprint, uh, of being good stewards of nature makes us think of nature as a pristine, untouched by human hands uh, world, and that and that it excludes both different ways of thinking about the environment, including um, the built environment, including urban environments, but it also makes us think that um, the goal of, na of environmentalism is to restore the purity of nature. Uh, and this obscures and excludes alternative ways of thinking about the relationship of nature um, in non-hierarchical and collaborative ways, um, because this idea of stewardship and this idea uh, both separates humanity from nature, but also uh, creates this hierarchy where human beings are, a, are, are elevated above nature and have a responsibility to preserve it. This model emph further emphasizes, as, as, many, uh, as others have argued, um, the, the knowledge of scientific el elites and, and, and a certain form of uh, objective knowledge about the environment and downplays indigenous and local knowledge and practices that can contribute to sustainability in favor of kind of one-size-fits-all guidelines. This ignores, uh, as McGregor argues, differences in culture and in geography that could change what sustainability really means. Um, and so, and it, and in, it also prioritizes, the, this uh, scientific model also prioritizes a particularly economic model uh, of a kind of cost-benefit analysis, uh, of a way of um, trying to uh, this idea of sustainability is about preserving enough environmental resources for future consumption. Um, but as, as, and as, but this is not the only way that environmentalism has been articulated. For example, um, uh, indigenous and climate activists have argued for a much uh, different concept way of thinking about what our response, how we should respond to climate change, and it's not about carbon pricing or about sustainability. It's a very, it's a much more radical demand. How much of the planet's problems are thanks to the white man? <laughs> Most of my problems are, I gotta say that. Indigenous rights have virtually been cut out of the UN climate deal. But indigenous people from every continent have been anything but absent here in Paris. What does it mean to you that perhaps the final text of this this deal won't include uh, the rights of indigenous people? It's so frustrating. They tend to be the first communities to feel they have. We're also oftentimes at the point of extraction, mining or fracking oils or double whammy that we're. Most of the world doesn't have respect for indigenous rights, and the rest of the world doesn't have respect for the rights of nature, the laws of nature. It's, uh, it's like, what can one person do? What can one country do? Because as long as it's, it's this kind of industry that the economy is being built on, then it's crime against nature. You have to keep fossil fuels in the you must put a moratorium. Sincere step that we can climate change. What is the has been the effects of the fossil fuel industry where you
Um, for my community, we have a coal company, they coal mine. They use gallons of water a year, basically for free. And we've been through forced relocations with our neighboring tribe and uh, land disputes. El cambio climático nos afecta a todos y los pueblos indígenas tenemos que dar un mensaje. Es decir, nosotros estamos cuidando. Respeto. Y un mensaje también para que la ciudadanía universal, que tuvieron el mismo principio origen original que nosotros, vuelvan a, re, a recuperar ese pensamiento. Porque lo han perdido, es, esa conexión. En spite of the challenges, groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network remain hopeful. What we're doing, uh, this, the social movements that you've seen across America, this climate justice movement, is winning and it's working. Just got to keep on pushing. And we'll talk more uh, about uh, indigenous uh, articulations of climate justice next week when we look at kind of um, uh, other ways of thinking about climate justice that we haven't studied so far. Um, but as you can see, the argument for a moratorium on fossil fuel usage is a very different argument than uh, reducing your uh, carbon footprint or kind of uh, emphasizing sustainable energies at the, at the personal level. So it's a very different way of thinking about green citizenship. The other main line of critique that McGregor makes is uh, the way that this model of green citizenship focusing on the individual private sphere of consumption um, is it, it privatizes environmental responsibility and it transforms citizenship into being a sustainable consumer or, um, or being engaging in pro-environmental behavior change. Uh, and that this basically reduces citizenship, which has a robust kind of political and public language and connotation to, uh, a, to private lifestyle choices. And that there, and one of the reasons why this is problematic from McGregor's perspective is that the arguments about changing in the private sphere, this place of consumption, gives very little little recognition to the gendering of labor within the private sphere. Um, so think, thinking about the things that sustainable citizenship would look like, buying local, uh, lowering, uh, lowering electricity and energy in the home, walking to work or to the grocery store, uh, the three R's of recycling, buying used clothing, repairing clothing rather than replacing it, these are all traditional unpaid domestic and reproductive labor performed in many cases by women. And in cases where this is paid labor, it's also often performed by lower class person, uh, lower class people and, and people of color, um, thinking of uh, the, the demographic representation of, uh, of maid services, for example, and, and uh, 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 food preparation and childcare. And so this can reinforce this emphasis on this, like transforming the private, your private life to be more sustainable can reinforce existing burdens and inequalities on the vulnerable. And we're already seeing that. You can see examples of this in the way, in, in, in our responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and, and so this is not a hypothetical extra. This is real, just an extrapolation of these already existing trends that we're seeing now. Um, so that buying locally sourced food, non-processed food, is great if you can easily walk to a farmer's market on Saturday mornings and have a flexible schedule to spend a long time cooking. Um, but this is harder if you're working multiple jobs or a single parent live in a food desert. And so this both uh, both the question of gender, the gendered labor of making uh, making your home life more sustainable, and also the differential costs of doing so are obscured in this generic kind of claim of be a good ecological citizen. So one example we can think of in, in, in more concrete terms is, is the decision by the California Energy Commission to mandate that all new homes built in California, with some exceptions based on uh, zoning requirements, must be built with solar panels starting this year. Now, on the one hand, this is obviously a good thing, um, as it would make homes more energy efficient, transform the economies of scale for producing solar energy, and encourage a much broader embrace of solar power. Um, and if you, but at the same time, and you can see the language of responsibility, even in this kind of uh, call out quote here, uh, that it, it is the responsible thing to do to install solar panels on your own roof. But at the same time, we all know that the California is facing a massive housing crisis. Uh, in Los Angeles County, there were 47,000 homeless people in 2016. 600,000 people are, consider, are, are considered severely rent burdened. Um, the solar um, 
which means they spent half their income on rent. Um, in 2017, more than 8,000 people people became homeless for the first time. Um, and the solar power mandate risks driving up the cost of homes in some of the most expensive places in the country, making it even harder to find housing. Um, and many, many have argued, urban planners have argued, that if we wanted to both reduce fossil fuel consumption, we could do it at the same time as reducing homelessness by shifting uh, zoning away from single family homes and pr promoting multifamily uh, construction like apartments and condominiums um, and creating more affordable housing closer to where people work to decrease their carbon footprint. That we have, if we, we can address these things simultaneously, but, ex but privatizing the burden of just like, oh, you should install solar panels on your home risks, again, exacerbating these existing inequality. The final critique that McGregor makes, and this is related to the first two, is that this depoliticizes responsibility. Uh, and she writes in 613 that the instrumental use of citizenship as a tool for promoting sustainability through the changing individuals rather than changing structures effectively depoliticizes environmentalism and dampens citizens' democratic potential. That changing individual environmental attitudes and behaviors um, are, is a good thing, but it leaves large-scale social, economic, and political systems intact. It doesn't create, it doesn't necessarily lead to policy change or encourage more voices to be heard in climate change negotiations. It doesn't change agricultural subsidies or encourage more public investment in, in sustainable energy. Um, but it turns the responsibility in, uh, into a from a political claim about how we should engage the public world and how we should collectively govern uh, the production and distribution of energy and food and, and housing and transportation uh, to the responsibilities that you as an individual have to do, have to engage in. And so this would be a good place to pause the video because we're going to turn in, a few, in just a second to McGregor's re kind of reformulation of uh, green citizenship in a robustly political sense. And you'll see certain overlaps with Iris Young's work and with um, Robin Eckersley's interpretation uh, of Young in the context of climate change. So how can we make green citizenship political? McGregor argues a few different ways. Um, the first is that rather than focusing on an abstract conception of the private sphere, that we should instead focus, we should instead, or an abstract conception of a citizen, we should instead focus on how, how citizens are embodied, that they have a, a fleshy bodily material existence, not just an ideal abstract one. And this does a couple of important things. On the one hand, it helps us see the similarities between humans, animals, and the rest of the natural material world. That humans, while humans are endowed with particular uh, um, uh, um, capacities and powers, um, that all of us, by virtue of having bodies, can be harmed and vulnerable. That our bodies are affected by environmental quality, they absorb pollution, that rising temperature places stresses on all of our bodies, and that the shared vulnerability can motivate more political demands for action. But at the same time, um, that this attending to the specific embodiment, the, the actual bodies that citizens inhabit, promotes a more intersectional analysis uh, in which we focus on concrete people who are differentially situated in terms of gender, class, ethnicity, sexuality, ability, state in the life cycle, and, other, and others. Um, that these all play an important role in differential vulnerability to climate change, as we've been studying, um, but also differential capacity to um, enact change within existing social structures. So rather than a generic and abstract duty to be resilient and sustainable, that we should focus on policies that are sensitive to these material inequalities and these differential, uh, differential embodiment and try to promote top qualities that address that. Her second uh, piece of suggestion is that we is that she calls for politicizing the private realm. And this is taking, uh, take, taking inspiration from feminist theories uh, like Rally and Cry that the, pro the personal is political. So rather than promoting, she writes on page 618, unpaid feminized pro-environmental behaviors as acts of citizenship, green citizenship should be a position from which to contend as part of a challenge to the relationship between green citizens and the states. That means it's not simply calling for us to all to recycle, um, but calling on government policies and public resources to be used to promote sustainable behavior so that the burden isn't falling uneven, on the unevenly vulnerable. So she writes on page 618 uh, that buying, washing, collecting, and transporting one's plastic bottles to uh, transforming this into a, pri uh, from, to a privately contracted recycling break bank is not citizenly acts. Instead of, 
Instead, a citizenly act is demanding free curbside recycling waste collection for all, or pressuring government to pass laws against unnecessary and wasteful packaging, thus reducing the need to recycle in the first place. The, 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 the work of citizenship isn't about what you do, isn't or at least it isn't just about what you do in the private sphere to reduce your footprint, but what you do in the public sphere to mobilize with other citizens to mo and to make demands on the, uh, on the government to make them and to mobilize the collective power of the community and of the state to actually transform uh, systems of production and consumption at, at the system level rather than at the individual level. And th this involves her third kind of piece of advice, which is shifting the balancing of citizenship by re uh, by re -bringing, bringing back the idea of environmental rights. Rather than focusing on expanding the duties and responsibilities of individuals to use less, to recycle, uh, to change their diets, etc., that we that citizenship also has an idea of a sense of public rights. Um, so while so while while this where there is an expanding duties, it is also important to um, call for uh, environmental rights that the citizens have the right to not suffer from the harms of climate change. And this what this does is it shifts the burdens of environmental protection from individuals to the state. It shifts the burden from environmentalism from something that individuals have to do, but uh, and individuals uh, are, are obligated to do as being good citizens to certain rights that individuals are entitled to. Uh, that individuals are, have a right to not to have a right to re recycling, have a right to uh, healthy and, and, and nutritious food, have a right to not suffer from air pollution and water pollution, and shifting those those demands, uh, 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 th th these obligations from personal to public demands, can politicize these calls for citizenship. But we can bring this back to, it, does this mean that we should do nothing at all as individuals? And, and so we can kind of recognize that individual actions are inefficient. I'm sure you are, many of you are familiar with the 2017 report by the Carbon Disclosure Pro Project that traced 70% of industrial greenhouse gas emissions since 1988 to uh, 100 companies. Um, but again, if we Jame if we turn back to Jameson's argument again from his 1992 piece as well as his, his piece on virtue ethics, once we start playing the the calculator game, once we start calculating outcomes, and once we start we can and we risk institutionalizing hypocrisy as we write that we even when we're talking about um, political civic action that we can very easily justify not taking action by saying, well, my vote or my letter to the uh, to my congressperson, um, my protest is not going to be enough to, to tip the scale. So why should I bother doing anything? And so, what role can personal changes play in in this kind of more politicized form of ecological citizenship? Uh, at the 2019 meeting of the Western Political Science Association, there was a roundtable by, by a series of political theorists on this very question. Uh, do individual green actions carry any public or political significance? And I want to share a couple of arguments that were made. Uh, the, Steve Vanderheiden argued that we should focus on character uh, for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's not the worst thing that we can do. It's um, you know, taking environmental actions in your private life is not making the world a worse place, as long as it's not trading off with anything else. Um, sometimes it's the best thing we can do. Um, some, uh, in limited political capacity means that the only thing that we can, if we can't, you know, rejoin the Paris Accord by ourselves, uh, we can't, if we might be, uh, we might fail to uh, elect um, climate uh, uh, candidates who are serious about climate justice. So maybe the only thing we can do is, is to transform our personal uh, behavior. And his third argument is, is that people are watching, and, and hypocrisy can be a powerful argument um, for for inaction, right? If, if if people look around and say like, oh, oh you and you've probably encountered you've probably encountered these arguments in the public sphere. Oh, all these environmentalists that the, their carbon footprints are huge as they they jet around from country to country to give speeches and, and organize protests about about uh, climate change. And this this hypocrisy claim can be. And may, even when it's not being made in good faith, can be a powerful dissuading, ar powerful argument dissuading action. And her, his fourth argument is that, oops, going the wrong way. Uh, his fourth argument is that what 
personal uh, changes can help articulate reasons for action. That it can give an explanation of, you, uh, and it gives you an opportunity to articulate why you are doing things. Um, when people ask, like, oh, why don't you? Why are you? Uh, why did you adopt a vegetarian diet? Or why did you uh, purchase an electric car? Or why are you installing solar panels, etc.? This gives you an opportunity to engage in a kind of public deliberative discourse. At the same roundtable, round Ross Mitiga um, made an argument for environmental exemplarity. Um, and, and he argued that those of us who are rel with relative security and knowledge, um, th um, that if you have knowledge about climate change and you have knowledge about environmentalism and you have relative economic and financial security, that there is a special obligation for those people to not only be political advocates, but to be exemplars of environmental sustainable lifestyles, to actually, you know, walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Um, and he argues that this consistency between values and ideals can add legitimacy to the claim by showing that you have kind of internalized these norms and take them seriously. Um, but more importantly, it also provides proof of feasibility that people um, that it shows that like, look, this is what a more sustainable world would look like. I'm living into that world and I'm showing that you can still live, have a healthy diet without eating uh, a lot of, uh, of meat, that you can still um, you can still have a, a successful career by limiting your air travel, etc. Uh, and, and in doing so, this can help drive uh, deep social change. Changing fundamental mindsets and behaviors requires actually persuading people, not just calling on the state to pass laws. That if you want social change from the ground up, you actually have to engage in this type of persuasiveness and individual change at some point. Um, and, and so this is not to reject McGregor's argument. But this is to add a little bit more nuance to what green citizenship in a politi robustly political sense might look like. And to think through these arguments in a more concrete example, on next class we're going to turn to the topic of fossil fuel divestment efforts, especially on college campuses. Um, so we can see how these debates over uh, over green citizenship, virtue, and responsibility all kind of co all can all interact with each other in a context that should be uh, that is familiar to you all and, and that you yourselves can easily see yourselves in. Um, so while you're reading these two articles, think about what models of responsibility fossil fuel divestment activists are enacting or demonstrating. And for the discussion thread for today, uh, do you find McGregor's critique and reformulation of green citizenship persuasive? If you do, describe a specific way that it could be applied in the real world, and if not, explain why this argument is flawed and in what way. And that's going to be it for today's mini lecture on green citizenship. As always, if you have any questions about the material, concerns about assignments, um, if you're having any sort of accessibility pro uh, um, issues, send me an email, stop by an office hour so uh, that we can work through something that is going to be fair and accessible for you. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.